So we've had we've heard all about um, the first Japanese in England, and we've heard all about um, William Adams, the first Englishman in Japan. We've heard about the East India Company. We've heard about um, the English factory um, and how it very sadly closed. Um, I was I was actually a little bit curious myself. Before I, I'm sure lots of you have questions too, but before we start, um, I was quite curious to hear more about um, the other English people besides William Adams, um, and whether we know anything about. I think maybe we have documents about um, whether they whether they took an interest in Japanese culture as William as Adams did, um, or whether they saw their role as being as it being entirely commercial, um, whether they were kind of interacting with with Japan. So do we know anything more about the lives? of the other English people in the English factory. I, th I think for the first 10 years, that's from 1600, Adams had no choice but. Yes. He had to become immersed in, in the culture and did so to the extent he did, uh, with deference to the ambassador's words earlier, he did gain a friendship with, the, with Iyasu. Um, we know that because there were opportunities uh, at Sunku and often taken for William and Iyasu together to have dialogue together. Now Iyasu just would not have uh, allowed this without some <coughs> respect from Adams um, shown uh, reflecting his knowledge of Japanese culture. do show, all the documents show that they were getting immersed in, in Japanese life and they did have Japanese partners, they had children and they were interested in their surroundings and yes I think that definitely comes up and they weren't just saying oh, oh we're English, we this I saw an article by Derek Massarella where he said that they spent quite a lot of time drinking um, and quite a lot of time in the red light district and quite a lot of time behaving rather disgracefully. Uh, no, I'm breaking all the rules here. Uh, I saw an article by Derek Masarella in which he said that the English, I suppose I'm, we're supposed to be saying very positive things today, but I read that they spent quite a lot of time drinking and some time in the red light district and some time looting Portuguese ships, which made them rather unpopular. Um, is, this, is, this, is this verifiable? Well, Derek Masarella is not with us, but he's a well known <laughs> scholar of this. He has a book called A World Elsewhere in which he tries to create the experience of the company. Um, so quite different from what us we describe. But Richard Cox, I always want to defend him because he um, has gone down as someone who didn't do a great job as running the East India Company the trading station. Uh, and um, Giles Milton has this book about, um, about Adams in which he turns Cox into a kind of laughing stock, which is completely incorrect. Cox was a highly trained um, intelligence. He was sent to Japan really because he had training both in selling wool and in dealing with Jesuit missionaries. He had um, basically uh, operated in the southern part of France, Bayonne, which where he was for a long time, uh, spying on uh, unwelcome uh, Catholic missionaries transshipping secretly via France to go to England. So uh, the answer is that these are all very interesting people. There's a lot of records left, but one thing the British Library doesn't have because they're in Cambridge is the um, books brought back by Sass, uh, which have recently been discovered in the, in the, in the Cambridge Library, in which he makes it, it makes it clear that he was actually buying and reading some quite significant things. Can I, can I just add as well that we're talking about the English in Japan, but of course there's, there's another presence with Tim, you, you kind of pointed um, out a little bit, about the Japanese sailors in England. Um, so the, the two we have heard about in great detail were not the only ones. Um, for instance, the, the ship that my man, Thomas Rowe, goes to India in, had 12 Japanese sailors. Um, you know, life expectancy wasn't particularly great on East India Company ships. Of, there was about a 30% chance that you'd come back alive if you went on one of these long voyages. But those ships had to be brought back somehow. So you quite often had people, and we know that the, the 12 Japanese sailors, along with 10 Gujarati sailors from India, all lived in the same kind of tenements um, in Port Portsmouth for a long while. 
So there's this wonderful image I have of these, these groups of Indian and Japanese sailors wandering down a Portsmouth kind of road, talking in their own languages and their own kind of ways of communicating. then did at one time combine. So when the English leave Japan, one reason that they are able to leave confidently is that they are in collaboration with the Dutch at that time. So they're basically handing over the Dutch. And I think I'm not mistaken in saying the reverse is the case in India where the English are stronger. And so the Dutch um, leave. Um, the real problem is that um, the, the Western companies have nothing to sell in Japan. And, and once the silver uh, starts to exhaust, the Japanese have nothing to sell the to the West, either, uh, copper comes to mind. But, but it seems like much a wonderful place to go to, and today we have lots to exchange. But there, it wasn't obvious that it was worth sending ships that far. Uh, and everyone's one is always concerned that profits aren't what they expect. Any more, any more questions uh, from you? Uh, uh, I just have one comment, which is, uh, it, it may not have worked for the British, uh, but why did it work actually effectively for the Dutch? It didn't. Uh, e e even when they had the monopoly later on. They don't make any money out of it. Individual Dutch people steal enough to make it worth my <laughs> fair. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Individual Dutch merchants rip off enough to make it worth worthwhile for themselves, but the Dutch East India Company hardly makes money in Japan. But because they have a very lucrative base on Java, it's not such a difficult thing to send ships um, further up. actually down in the Spice House, it wasn't actually in Japan, it was uh, the first colony outside the British Isles of England was essentially one of the Spice Isles, the Isle of Brum, right. Brum um, who declared um, allegiance to James I in 1616, 1616, sorry, from Manhattan, that comes later on uh, when the uh, rights to that colony are given up. However, the conflict was that the Dutch were genocide essentially to make plantations of spices and the islanders thought that the English might be able to protect them. Unfortunately they were absolutely wrong in that fact but that was the source of the conflict and the source of the main issue there. Well, so I thought there was a question at the back. Uh, yes please. In the middle as well. On, on the island. And could, you, could people give their names when they yes, ask could you? a question? Uh, yes, Hugh Sandland. To follow okay. up on the point made by uh, Raju Dunn about not having much to sell, do the documents that were shown with bills of lading from elsewhere in Asia, do they demonstrate that the English realised very quickly they could only make money by intra-Asian trade? Or uh, did it take too long for the penny to drop? Uh, in other words, that there was no Voyage to Cochin China, which is an example of them, the intra Asian trade, that was 1614. So I think they, they very quickly decided this was, you know, with Adams telling them that these things won't sell, you're going to have to go elsewhere. And I think they, it, the penny very quickly dropped. Yeah, uh, the, 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 
they have a lot great though with galley pots. Uh, and, and, and interesting enough, Sir Thomas Smith owned the galley pot making factory in Southwark, so he was particularly keen to sell these things. They seem to have done all right. But it is really sensible to sell the ship to Japan. You know, they, they sell probably three or four times the cost, but it doesn't cover the, cover the cost. No. So it's really precious metals, and the Dutch remain because while silver is ex exhausted, Japan still has uh, copious copper over it. I wanted to ask Tim. Um, there's only Tim's here. No, there's a Tom and Tim. <laughs> Tom, Tim, and Tim. Tim. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask Tim, Tim on the street. Uh, the um, Northeast Passage, uh, which was apparently one of the motivations for the British going to Japan in the first place, how far did Adams or others get in looking for it? Yeah, I, think may, I think maybe other people can answer. But, maybe, but the, the, it was always predicated on sailing either over Russia or through Hudson Bay, which they thought ought to link up to the Pacific at the other side. Um, and uh, 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 Thomas Smith, as well as heading the Cedar Company, went on a, a diplomatic mission to Russia, to Boris Godunov, and he asked for three things. One is to be allowed to sail over the top of Russia as far as they can get, and second, to not allow the Dutch to do the same, uh, and thirdly, that anything from Persia and the Indies can be exported by Archangel, without taxation. They think they're going to bring Indian things through Russia, export them to the north. Uh, and of course it doesn't work because the seas are frozen. But Adams was instructed to attempt to find the passage on the other side. Um, Shogun Iyasu, or what? Uh, Iyasu certainly supported this notion uh, directly to Adams and said, look, I will uh, give you my backing to look to the north. There, there was a a fabled gulf or channel, I think, is it called Anya, um, uh, which Adams was given full leeway to go and see. After um, Iyasu's death, Hidetada, uh, via Mukai Shogun, asked Adams directly, this is in 1616, asked him, are you interested in commanding my ship to go? Adam's blunt reply was, no, I'm working, and he wasn't under contract at that point, I'm working for the East India Company. And I think that was one of his uh, personal downfalls whilst in Japan, uh, that he, um, he made that bold statement. But his own notion was perhaps eventually he could return to England, which he wanted to do as a rich man. Uh, just like Nicholas Diggins had become rich. Uh, he wanted to go back, hopefully, as the discoverer of the either northeast, north, east, north west passage, whichever he would choose to call it. Right. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and don't speak till you get the microphone? Thank you very much. Uh, Fabio Kiki Soas, University of London. Um, we've talked, uh, I've heard a lot about the symbolic value of the telescope and it's as a fascinating object but there was talk of military technology earlier on and I thought wasn't that also cutting edge technology at that time and did it have an impact was it understood not only to be a gift but also to be a new kind of technology that could change the way we see the battlefields for example yes we can I guess that's, that's me um, we know the telescope was received uh, and that, and we know it doesn't exist today. And if it had been still in existence when Iyasu died in 1616, it almost certainly would have been donated with all his worldly goods to um, his mausoleum, and it's not there. So something had gone wrong with it between 1613 being presented and 1616 Iyasu's death. So was it dropped? <laughs> I mean, they're quite fragile. But you're absolutely right that we think, of course, of, 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 of Galileo and, and uh, terrestrial discovery, uh, uh, um, celestial discoveries, but it would have had military value. And in fact, it's quite possible that it was taken to the Battle of Osaka and, and just didn't survive treatment there. Unfortunately, we don't know. But the, 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 the cannon that the British had looked like, more, uh, I think the point about the cannon is, is interesting because uh, there are also rumors that someone uh, the original cannon on board the Liefde, uh, the Dutch ship that Adams had piloted and uh, arrived in 1600, uh, were used in October 1600 in 
the mass battle at uh, Seki Gahara. Um, uh, so the ambassador mentioned earlier uh, which it cannot use uh, for the, uh, the destruction of uh, the, uh, Osaka during the fall, during the siege in uh, 1615. But um, it's quite possible that British cannon were used earlier very decisively, and Dutch cannon. Uh, certainly, uh, when the Japanese decided that uh, they wanted to get rid of all the Christians in southern Japan uh, after the Shimabara uprising of 1638, uh, the, the, the Dutch gained a lot of brownie points supplying uh, ammunition and cannon, uh, which helped the destruction of Shimabara. So uh, military technology was very important then. And I think in the second half of this conference, we're going to hear uh, how important it remains. Yes, uh, the military technology was exported from Japan. The two sets of armor were Japanese military technology. The English came in peace. Uh, yes, if you hit it, I don't actually said the two armors. But the cutting edge technology on, on military was actually strategy in those days. Order number no one discovered the volley fire technique, which indirectly seems to have been used first by the Dutch in Europe. Um, how the Dutch got that from Japan is unclear, or it was invented totally separately, which is entirely possible. The Dutch also exported Japanese weapons around Asia, including to Siam and other places as well, suggesting that the Japanese guns, uh, as well as their pole weapons, Naginatas, etc., were actually, as far as the Dutch concerned, superior to the European technology at the time. to think about and keep in mind is that some of that um, offering, shall we say, or the, the narrative around offering Western technology is also driven by very pragmatic concerns, which is that the English did not have any other suitable gifts to offer. Um, so what do you do in those cases? And we see that happening in, the, in Istanbul, um, in Constantinople, we see that happening among the Safavids and in Mughal India as well, where the English, when they're struggling to offer suitable presents, then go to the, the gift of knowledge in some way. Their idea of that kind of scientia comes to their rescue, so they use technology. Um, from the German trade fairs. Um, get given in all of these Asian courts? What, uh, the Kremlin Museum has been mentioned, and uh, people who've visited it have uh, sometimes been surprised to find a fine English carriage, uh, which was the gift chosen uh, for Thomas Smith uh, when he, he went uh, on his official mission to open up trade with Russia uh, with Boris Godunov. Uh, in the case of four or five can cannon brought on the clove, uh, they were sold to Iyasu, and their value, in fact, it was roughly equivalent to what it would have been had other goods been sold, uh, to half the value, the total value, uh, of, of the goods the clove carried. Iyasu was very much keen to get these cannon, which were medium-sized Seika, I think a demi cauldron uh, was included. We know that from the size of the shot. Simply divide the number of shot into the total weight, which is in those records, <laughs> and, and you have the capacity of the cannon. We were very much desired by Iyasu. He insisted they come to Edo, but they were almost certainly also used in the siege of Osaka Castle in 1615. I mean, what, what is surprising is some of the highest technology in, uh, created in the world in terms of steel was uh, Japanese sword making uh, from the Middle Ages. So in some ways it's surprising that there wasn't more of an expert of that technology. Uh, was there a control in the export or did people just not think of it? There wasn't a control at the beginning, but by 1620 both Japanese people and Japanese weapons were supposed to be exported, so I don't know the details, I'll leave it there. Sure. Well, next book. Um, Bill. <laughs> well, actually, you just all answered my question, which was about the technology exchange. 
and the thought that Britain was not, England was not techno technologically advanced at that time, and therefore how much came the other way. There are questions on the, this side, no? Okay, any more questions? There's a question over there. If you can... And another one, and uh, another one in the middle. My feelings on the matter, my personal feelings, are that Saris in particular regarded Adams as an interloper. Now that's a very specific term uh, describing non-merchants engaging in mercantile activity at the time. And there were many interlopers around, but they were absolutely hated by merchants who'd gone through their own apprenticeship to become a merchant. They earned the, the, the title after their name on their will, so-and-so merchant, just as Adams would have earned, Adams Mariner, uh, and uh, never the twain should meet. So I think Saris and Adams had a really big blow up. Saris might well have preferred Uraga, it would have been the sensible decision, but I think he did it to spite One more yes. question of somebody in the middle. is in Edo Bay, near the mouth of Edo Bay, um, but not very far from Yokosuka, just to the south of Yokosuka. It offers a fine natural inlet yeah. and good access to Edo. And the announcement to your question, I think it would have made a huge difference. <laughs> Uh, instead of the uh, massive extra costs of Tron shipping goods uh, via Hirado, which is uh, right down in the south of Japan. Uh, were, um, Edo was growing, Edo was the shogun's capital, and with the favor of the shogun, that, that was the decision that should have been taken. Uh, uh, the, yeah, I was going to say the opposite. <laughs> the thing is. As, as we've been establishing, that, that really the money was made by selling Asian goods to Japan. Uh, and Hirado is much closer to the Asian um, places, so that, so that probably if they had opened in Kuraga, the Edo Bay, they would have also required a place in Hirado to be able to sell to places such as, such as Siam. But I also think that Dick is absolutely right, that there was a power struggle between Cyrus and uh, and, and Adams about uh, who, was, who knew what. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. One more. Or two. One in the back. One in the back, one in the filling back. Um, yeah, that's me. It's Jason James from the Diamond Foundation. Um, the people in Ito City used to tell me that um, there were snatches of English contained in the sea shanties sung by the fishermen of that area, even now. And so they argued that this was probably the place where English was first spoken in Japan, uh, while uh, William Adams was you know, making his ships and, and training his sailors. Do the panel believe that to be true? Um, Adams building his ships at Ito would have been in conversation solely with Dutchmen uh, or Japanese people. He had no one to speak in. All I can say, Jason, is that my father sang, What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Any dog. I think it's more likely that your father was the, uh, the original. I still sing what he talked about. Adams literally did not speak English for 13 years. It was too corrupt. Um, so, there you go. Okay, I think this has to be the last question. Uh, this has to be the last question. Sorry, it was, it was just a quickie, because I'm, I'm terribly interested in this talk of slavery. Who benefited from the enslavement of Japanese or the press gang of 
Japanese, and you know, did they ever come back? Was it all to the Philippines? Very briefly, um, the, everybody, apart from the victims of the slavery, benefited from this. The original uh, warriors who enslaved these people sold them to middlemen, and then they were sold generally to mariners, merchants, slave merchants, and taken aboard. Did any of them come back? We don't really have any records from the slaves' point of view, unfortunately, and we know that these two particular slaves did not make it back. Unfortunately, they were some of the most fortunate of these several, probably tens of thousands of people. The majority ended either in the concubinage, um, in, uh, all around the world, as far as Portugal, um, Mexico City, uh, particularly Manila, China, uh, India. Um, the boys were often used as sailors, mariners. These two are perfect examples of that, or as ballets. Excellent book submitted by Lucy de Souza, if anybody is interested. No, um, it, it's a great topic and, and very much omitted, and that book, which, which Thomas mentioned, is really important. But we also have to be careful the word slave is so emotive, and it just makes you think of people in chains being whipped, and that's dreadful, right? And that did happen, but that's not, these were too valuable to be, you know, they weren't expendable slaves, and they weren't, um, and they didn't, uh, um, you weren't born into slavery. So really, there's a kind of client relationship these people had probably no chances in life anyway. But they'd just been on the, they'd been on the losing side or something, and either that or they'd been killed or they'd been sent to use. So it seems like Christopher and Cosmos are a very good example of people who probably were technically speaking enslaved, uh, but they were in a curious kind of way actually treated quite well. And so just, they were kind of paid. They would have been paid. Uh, it was, slaves were normally paid in Asia at this time. They had the rights to have wives, property, slaves of their own, and also uh, many of them became The vast majority, of course, didn't have such a nice outcome. Um, I'm just going to make a quick comment on the residue of Japanese culture outside Japan in this first period of history. One of, one of the fascinating places to see it is on uh, the facade of St. Paul's Cathedral in Macau. Uh, if you study uh, the imagery on the cathedral, a lot of it isn't Christian, although uh, the stonemasons were often uh, Japanese Christian converts uh, who uh, no longer got a chance to go back to Japan after the persecution of Christians had begun in a big way. A subject we haven't really uh, talked about much in uh, this discussion. But uh, it's interesting, some of the traditional um, monsters and uh, mythological animals uh, of Japan are there to be found on the facade of St. Paul. So I recommend it to you all. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, oh, first of all, can we have a big hand for all our speakers?